Zombie Tech. <sighs> Welcome to Zombie Tech, a forum for engineers, scientists, and inventors to ponder on the technologies needed to survive the inevitable zombie apocalypse. She's Addie. He's Whisker. And today we've today. got uh, someone who I'm sure many of you have uh, bumped into before, yes. making your rounds around the usual haunts of the uh, community here. We have uh, Adam or Vaya Con Queso. Go Vaya with cheese. Con Queso. Oh, Vaya. Hello. Yeah. Otherwise. Vaya Queso or Adam or uh, AJ Fabio on Twitter. I've yep. got a bazillion names. Yep, yep. You are actually one of the few people who uh, has so many different names, I think. Yeah, I've got to settle on uh, on one. I think I might go Roy's, Roy uh, Eltham's way and just use my regular name. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. For the purposes of today's uh, episode, I think we'll stick to Adam. Okay. Adam. <laughs> so uh, what do you got going on, Adam? I know you run a blog every so often. Yeah, I have a, a blog at... Um, I violated all the rules of uh, picking a website and, and went with the uh, Renaissance Engineer, which um, is a kind of a funny story how I, how I got that. It's uh, one of the guys at work, you know, uh, a manager at work, actually. I was telling him how I do hardware and software, and he said, oh, so you're a jack-of-all-trades, master of none. And I'm like, well... <laughs> thanks, guy. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I kind of prefer Renaissance Man. And I was like, oh, wait, that's an idea. That's a nice name. So I kind of... You know, grabbed it and uh, had to shorten it down to the Rengineer dot com. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I have a blog there that I'm. I have to update more regularly, but I am keeping up. Um, and uh, I have my day job uh, where I do uh, radar and air traffic control, um, cool. hardware and software. And then uh, by night, uh, I'm the Batman. No, I. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, do a lot of uh, open source hardware and um, robotics. Um, I've taught some classes on robotics to kids. Oh. And, um, yeah, I taught a class of sixth graders, um, which was really cool. That's cool. And this was, all, this was before FIRST was around, so. mm -hmm. but I've done FIRST as well. And um, quadcopters and uh, pretty much uh, all sorts of stuff. I mean, I have interest in music and uh, photography. Um, I spent most of the weekend running around Maker Faire with my Nikon and uh, getting lots of pictures, which are up on Flickr. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Adam so. was at Open Hardware Summit and Maker Faire over this last weekend, and Yay. I'm sure we're going to get to that in a bit. Um, I really like the, uh, the idea of uh, Renaissance engineering. I like the idea of that because there's so many of us, including Addy and myself, in this community that aren't interested in any specific uh, branch of engineering. We're interested in many. Mm -hmm. And it, it does remind me quite a bit of the Renaissance. It's true. And especially in, you know, kind of the embedded systems field that, that a lot of us kind of, you know, dabble in, in, in the terms of the propeller processor and the Arduino. Um, you got to know hardware and software. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I mean, there's guys I work with um, that they don't know what a binary coded decimal is or how to, you know, how to use them in a program. They're just software people. And it's like, well, you know, you got to know this stuff. Um, and, you know, I, I explain it to them, but uh, it's, it, you know, it's stuff like that. Um, knowing that, knowing how to drive a motor or, uh, you know, get an audio input into a circuit with a digital to analog converter, stuff like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's no end to the number of things that are involved in doing just the what we think of as very basic tasks these days because there's been created so many layers of separation between the average uh, consumer slash user of technology and the actual metal that's doing the work. Right. So if I want to do something like record a vocal... Uh, for a song, uh, and that to me, that's as simple as okay. I take this, I stick it in front of Addy, I put a cable <laughs> between here and there, and right. let the computer do the work. And I've never been satisfied with that being the answer, right? I mm -hmm. need to know how that mic works. I need to know 
how the preamplifier works. I need to know how the digital, uh, the analog to digital converter works, how the file format works on the computer, uh, how the editor works. And, you know, I'm slowly but surely replacing every single piece of gear in this studio with <laughs> stuff I've made my, myself. Mm -hmm. Just because I want to know how it works under the hood. And I think and that's, you know, there's many of us that are like that. It's not just enough to take the boxed solution and accept it. Yeah, and that's, I mean, something I've done, uh, you know, one of my big hobbies is uh, radio control planes and helicopters and cars. And, um, you know, I, I've started with that. You know, the speed controls that were out there at the time, they uh, way back when, weren't very good. And uh, I was building... Uh, new speed controls, you know, figuring out uh, better MOSFETs that were used and better circuits in general. And uh, things have caught up now with, with things like brushless motors and uh, um, a lot of other advances in batteries, especially uh, lithium polymer batteries. Mm -hmm. Quadcopters is a topic that keeps popping up on this show over and over again. It's, it's interesting how many people are uh, working on those. Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny because um, I have drawings from when I was about... 11 years old or so of uh, a quadcopter um, and well I mean the design I mean people have been trying to do it for years I think there's there's black and white footage from the Wright Brothers era of you know that type of design the hard parts controlling it um, and uh, I was trying to do it with an Apple computer and relays back then not even transistors and I never quite worked right but uh, it got off the ground uh, um, tethered though with a, with a, you know it wasn't carrying its own batteries, but uh, now no, with not bad still got off the ground, <laughs> mm -hmm. and things got better you know through the age of uh, mechanical gyros that actually had spinning you know real spinning gyros in them and now with uh, the you know electronics getting lighter and lighter, but what's amazing is the RC people are are doing exactly like what you were saying with the audio equipment they are taking. Um, more and more of, of their radio control um, planes and helicopters and building their own stuff. Um, you know, you can go to SparkFun and, or Adafruit or any of the sites and buy a, a, an accelerometer um, and uh, buy a gyro. And, and from there, you can hook that up to a microcontroller and the receiver, and you've got yourself a whole uh, radio control system. And from there, it's not too hard to add a GPS, and now you've got an unmanned aerial vehicle. Yeah, and with uh, tools like the propeller, I mean, you base this around the microcontroller that has a large you know, group of people writing objects to interface with all these different things like GPS uh, modules and sensors and whatnot. And, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you've got all of the pieces. You've got all of the hard parts done, the drivers. You know, that's the hard stuff. And all mm -hmm. you need to do is write the glue. Write the glue, and, and the tweaking is the hardest part, the well, PID yeah. loops. <laughs> Especially to... when you're talking about something that needs to go up in the air and not tip over and crash into a house or something. Right. Um, but when, and when you really take it to the extreme, which like the guys at the Grasp Lab, um, which are those amazing uh, quadcopter videos, I think that I, I got to think that that's really what uh, got everybody into it was the grasp lab videos of these things going, doing incredible maneuvers um, sideways and flipping over and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and even though they, they kind of cheat, uh, in my opinion, because they, they don't have the electronics really uh, on the quadcopters. They actually have cameras in that room um, that are hooked up to you know, pretty much supercomputers that are controlling everything mm -hmm. via radio control. Um, but uh, I think that's one of the things that really grabbed everybody's attention. And uh, it's cool. It's a lot of fun. And they can be used against zombies. Sweet. What, now, I think we've done, uh, we've suggested surveillance. We've suggested grenade launching. And mainly those two for quadcopters. What, do you, what else do you think quadcopters can be used as in the zombie apocalypse? Well, you don't necessarily have to kill them. Um, you know, one of the things they've said with zombies is they're very easily distracted. Mm -hmm. So... One of the things uh, that I would think to do is, you know, if you see a group coming um, from my other ho from my other hobbies is uh, um, photography. They have some pretty. It's pretty easy to trigger a strobe remotely. Oh, so you I could see. do. So you have a little zombie rave going on. 
Yeah, yeah. Pretty much, uh, <laughs> you know, the quadcopters can lift quite a bit. So uh, you get some, some batteries and a decent uh, strobe light. <laughs> a and, little disco uh, ball. Oh, yeah. Sweet. All the zombies do... go for the disco ball. <laughs> now, you can do that, or you could carry a few of them, and then if you can get the thing low enough to not harm them, drop the, guy, drop the strobes on the ground and let the zombies have their rave if you, as you fly it away. <laughs> true, true. So let me ask, is it enough to Google for this information, or are there sites, like particular sites that... Um... Or projects I think, well, that you know you would recommend people go to if they've never worked with a quadcopter before. Um, there's a lot of information at DIY Drones, um, okay. and that's um, Chris Anderson, I believe, his site. Um, there's a lot of information there, but if you want to go on like a, a forum, one of the best uh, radio control forums in general is uh, RC Groups, mm-hmm. and there's a huge um, quadcopter group there with many open source projects. There's a few propeller ones, there's some AVR based ones and some even some ARM based ones. Huh. Um, and uh, they just the one the one caveat there is they call it uh, multi rotor helicopters because they have uh, they have to separate it out from uh, the uh, what do you what would you call it? Um, coaxial helicopters. Yeah. Which have one rotor above and the other. Not all quadcopters necessarily have four rotors right now. I've seen a few with six. So it's probably a better term at the end of the day. And you can do it with three as well. Um it's uh, uh anything that's more than two rotors in line. Is considered a quadcopter. Now I yeah. seem to remember you went to a conference of some sort not too long ago that was dealing with uh a drone technology. Is that right? I went. I was at the AUVSI conference down in Washington D.C., which is a um, covers all sorts of unmanned aerial vehicles and actually ground and water as well. Um, and uh, I was there for, on the aerial side. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things there, is, you know, the issues there is that they're dealing with is uh, well, first off, the technology is amazing. I mean, um, we have machines out there that can do all sorts of um, surveillance and you'd never know they were even uh, watching you of course most of this is military (laughs) sure yeah you know interesting but uh it's really i mean if if, uh, the zombie apocalypse happened i'd definitely go and try to grab a few predators and (laughs) and what's a predator (laughs) it's uh one of the military uh pilotless uh aerial drones it's about the size of weapons what so, you know, they can fly it like an RC airplane over to the target and, you know, shoot whatever they want with it and mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. But, you know, we're more interested here in what we can actually do. And um, that's really like that. We've actually had conversations about this for, before, Adam. They're they're mm-hmm. trying to do some interesting regulations to stop certain groups of people from being able to develop uh, drone technology. Uh, That's... you were saying that, uh, you were into doing aerial photography with it and then they changed some rules. Right. Um, this was back around 2004, 2005. Um, I, when digital cameras first finally got light enough to put on an RC plane, I was one of the, you know, people on RC groups that uh, did it and, um, actually started a business taking pictures. I had a little uh, oh. downlink so you could see what the camera saw. Mm-hmm. Um, although I didn't fly via the downlink. I was flying by watching the plane. And uh, I was doing some uh, uh, aerial photos for construction companies. They would want um, like mm-hmm. uh, progress updates mm-hmm. and real estate as well. And just about that time, um, the FAA kind of noticed what was going on. Um, it also didn't help that people were posting pictures of uh, they were flying over airports. And, uh, oh, look, here's a passenger jet on final approach from above, from an <laughs> RC plane. <laughs> so the, F- the FAA kind of clamped down. Um, sure. They didn't, I mean, nobody came out guns a-blazing or anything like that. But uh, I kind of saw the writing on the wall, so I uh, stopped what I was doing before it got before uh, it got out of hand and I, you know, and people got shut down, but they did stop things. And uh, now, if you want to fly a, a aerial, you know, a plane 
um, even in a regular RC plane with a camera on it as a business, you basically can't. You have to get a certificate of airworthiness from an airframe and power plant mechanic and mm -hmm. a whole bunch of waivers from the FAA. It's a lot of money and it's pretty much they regulated it out of existence mm -hmm. um, as far as a legal venture. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to do it as a hobby, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> so you can still take pictures above you just can't sell your pictures. Exactly. Or you can't be doing that flight for money. Um, <laughs> Which doesn't make any sense whatsoever. That's how the FAA kind of works. And um, What was that guy charging for pictures what, above? I mean, for pictures that... Well, I, we don't know that, that he was charging, example? but uh, Adam here was charging for his when services. I was, yeah, when I was doing it, I was charging. Right. The guy that flew over the airport wasn't... He was just a kid. Right. Um, but... Uh, you know the the point was that the FAA was trying to to you know clamp down on it, and they also saw what was going to happen, which is you know groups like the paparazzi get their hands on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, not that the paparazzi really give a crap about the laws anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so now I've heard about Google building a couple of these quadcopters to sort of enhance their ability to do their Street View mm -hmm. material. It, it seems to me like, considering that they're obviously a commercial endeavor, that they would be having to jump through all these hoops. And they, they, I believe they are. So um, you think they've gone through and paid all the fees and got everything signed off on? Even, even if you do all that, you have to, every single flight, you have to have a, uh, a waiver. Plan? Oh my gosh. Not just a flight plan, a waiver from the FAA. Um, it's not wow. much different than if you had a... Uh, if you wanted to buy a MiG fighter or a, a classic uh, fighter jet, from uh, uh, you need a waiver every time you want to fly that. So uh, that's kind of the the hmm. idiocracy of it uh, is that it's you know this, we're talking about a plane that weighs two pounds. I mean, yes, it's it, there is some danger you wouldn't want it to fall on somebody's head. Well, in this case, I don't know if it is an idiocracy because I know I for one don't want uh, any companies, let alone you know, Google, who, you know, is data mining is their job, uh, mm. flying remotely into my backyard, you know? Right. Well, I mean, Google, the companies like that, they're flying Cessnas anyway with really powerful lenses. So if they want to watch us, um, they can. Uh, I say it, but that's the way it is. Um, and they have, you know, it, it doesn't cost, I mean, for a company like Google, it doesn't cost much to have a satellite you know, turned and pointed, um, but mm -hmm. usually it'd be more like an airplane, you know, a small plane. Um, I have, I actually have some pictures of Microsoft's uh, Street View car up on one of my websites, um, and uh, they basically took the pod that they fly under the plane and put it on top of a truck, and it's some pretty amazing laser range finders and, mm -hmm. and high-resolution cameras. Yeah, I, I saw a little bit of that. I don't want to get too far off topic here before I wrap up just this one last question mm -hmm. on that front uh, or point i guess uh it seems like the the idea of you own your property people can't go through it but airplanes can go over the top of it was settled about a hundred years ago or so right um that i'm not sure well whenever I mean, it was they pretty much said yeah people can fly over your thing. Oh, yeah, Duh. you have no, you have no control. One over... thing that I think might make people a little nervous about this kind of technology is that, I mean, obviously you've got the airplanes, you've got the satellites, but when something is 30 feet off the ground and it's in your backyard, that's like under the level of your roof. Oh, and yeah. That's yeah. a different story. I mean, I don't think that that should be in the jurisdiction of the FFA, or the FAA, to say whether or not somebody can fly at that level, right? Right. With when we're talking a few tens of feet above the ground, that's I don't think that should be protected or you know determined by that organization because it's a federal organization. Right, and I don't I don't know that anyone's ever you know I know four hundred feet is a number that's thrown around a lot mm -hmm. um, for the RC people. Mm -hmm. They're not supposed to go above 400 feet, and you know, real planes aren't supposed to fly below. I believe. Uh, I'm not a I'm not a pilot. I have flown Cessnas, you know, with uh, pilots, but I'm not a pilot myself. Oh, that's 
Um, but someone who, who is would probably could tell you better than I as far as the legalities of it. But mm -hmm. it's you know a similar thing to mineral rights. Um, if you buy a piece of property, you may not own what's below it, mm -hmm. uh, which is another scary thing you know, with, with fracking and all the other stuff that's going on, um, especially here in New York. Fracking? Um, that's where they uh, drill, not drill, they pressurize the ground to push oil out and uh, oh. people are having... Uh, their faucets, um, they can light their faucets on fire with l oh. lighters and things like that. Oh, my gosh. What the heck? <laughs> Holy yeah, focus. it's uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, don't drink the tap water there in New York. That's, that's way up, it's upstate, though. Basically, uh, don't support the uh, petrochemical companies at all if you can help it. That's the real solution right. here. Uh, do other stuff, folks. Do other like, stuff. I heard you guys were building a truck. Maybe. Maybe. Heck yeah, zombie truck. Zombie mm. truck. We're gonna have to. We still have some stuff to look up for it. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, it's uh, a big project, so you know project. it'll take years. Nineteen thirty-nine, yeah. nineteen forty, 1940 Chevy truck, cutest thing ever. <laughs> it is. So they Ed, are. Eddie and I are thinking of uh, building an electric vehicle from a uh, seventy-year-old pickup truck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a. That'll be a fun project. Um, the one thing, uh, definitely be careful of the weight. Um, yep. But the, the great thing about electric uh, cars, and you know, I know uh, a friend who built an electric DeLorean, um, is uh, off the line. They are torque, torque, incredibly torque. powerful. Yeah. So if you need to get away quick from wherever you are for whatever reason, <laughs> you may not get very far. <laughs> This is the uh, 15 this feet is the later, zombie but, but, apocalypse but, but. we're talking about, and you know you don't have time or road to get through those first three gears, guys. Mm -hmm. All right, the uh, petroleum-based you know internal combustion engine doesn't make as much sense if you're trying to get away in the zombie apocalypse because you want that torque instantaneously. Either that, or be so la uh, light that it doesn't matter. Um, like uh, some of the uh, you know motorcycles or dirt bikes. Yeah. Um, I've said dirt bikes a few times now. It's a good idea. And that's something I've always you know I, I when I was a, a lot younger I read Stephen King's uh, The Stand, which it's not a zombie apocalypse, but it's kind of a fall of society book. Yep. And uh, grabbed a, there were a lot of he did a lot of stuff in there that I was like that's what I would do. Um, CB you know the CB radio for communication and mm -hmm. um, uh, motorcycles because you know early on. It, you know, people are going to leave their cars on the freeways. So you can, all the main arteries are going to be clogged. Yep. Um, so it, it, motorcycles or aircraft are pretty much going to be the only way to get around um, uh, at all. Motorcycles so and aircraft. Hmm. Or so off-road. So then we'll have you build us a passenger airplane. How about that? True. Yeah. Since you know There's... both hardware and software, you could totally build one enough for the zombie apocalypse team. And then we could book it to like Aruba. Oh, yeah. We just got to be careful of the zombies that uh, try to cross the ocean. That is true. That is true. We talked a little bit about that last week uh, uh, in regards to Hawaii and uh, <laughs> decided that maybe that's not the best idea <laughs> to uh, go to an island. We'll see. We'll see. So then... Um, from that conference, oh, and AUVSI, it's the um, Unmanned Aerial Systems International. There. Did you uh, see anything interesting at that place other than... Uh... Or any interesting technology that's coming on to the... Um, there's some definite, uh, some, definitely some stuff that was real interesting was in the radar uh, side of things. They have, um, there's something called Inverse Synthetic Aperture Radar, which is uh, ISAR. Basically, uh, you can use this has been around for a long time, but uh, they've gotten it down to the point where you can you can carry it on something like a quadcopter. Oh my gosh! Uh, it's, it's using a radar as a camera, so pretty much you have a, a this plane or a quadcopter or anything flying around, and you point the radar dish, which is very small. It's a, it's actually it's not even a dish. It's a flat. Looks like a circuit board, huh. and you can get a black and white image. Um, so you can actually see the zombies approaching. Wow. So, Miles away. Wow. So it's like uh, that, an ultrasound, kind of. Kind of. Um, it, uses, it uses Doppler shift and things like that. Okay, um, yeah. 
so it is similar to ultrasound um but uh and it'll still work as a standard radar you know you can track objects and things like that mm -hmm. that's really interesting um some of the stuff that irobot's doing with their ground based vehicles um you know to go in and and uh check buildings to make sure there's nothing in them mm -hmm. um you know they they can climb stairs and and all sorts of uh, pretty cool stuff. More than just vacuums. <laughs> <laughs> a lot more than just vacuums. Um, and uh, uh, some of the, the helicopters that are coming up. Uh, I mean, now, you know, the the large corporations in the military, they're, rather than go smaller, they're going bigger, and they're basically taking, like, uh, regular helicopters and just putting computers in them. Hmm. Um, rather yeah, than... Yeah, that's a typical military solution to a problem. Yeah, and, Make um, it bigger? Yeah. Or stick a computer in it? We've got an existing infrastructure based on petroleum and large helicopters. Can we reuse the technology which already exists in our arsenal? Can we exactly. retrofit these systems into existing ones? Yeah, that's it's all very standard military hmm. ways of doing things. Oh, we've got the spares. We've got this. We've got that. You know. <laughs> It's, and, you know, it, it all looks good on paper that way because it's like, okay, how can we cut costs to make this happen? Right. And whenever they try to do something new, um, they they can bury themselves in requirements. And, you know, that's what happened to the presidential helicopter. Hmm. So, so which that's a whole other story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's uh, swing across on the completely opposite side of the spectrum because um, Thursday, I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, you were over at the Open Hardware Summit mm -hmm. in New York City. So yeah, was it on the well, in Manhattan in, or Long Island? It was at the Hall of Science. That's in Queens, in Queens. Um, with the New York with the uh, Good Chinese World's food Fair. Uh, the '64 World's Fair and the '39 World's Fair was held. Mm -hmm. So um, everybody knows it from um, Men in Black. Those weird buildings that they kind of blew up at the end. I think it was Men in Black too. Sure, uh, there. <laughs> Cool. Very so, cool. Now, I know you ran into uh, a bunch of people from the community there, didn't you? Oh, yeah. I met um, Robot Girl, Erin. Um, I met Mighty Ohm, uh, Jeff Kaiser. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jeffrey Blum. Uh, uh, Jeremy Blum? I'm sorry, Jeremy Blum. Blum, Blum <laughs> rather. <laughs> Jeremy Blum. Uh, I think we're going to have him on here next week. Yep. yep. Yeah. He's a he's a really great guy. He was demonstrating um, his pseudo glove, and I actually got some pictures of that. Cool. Um, he's a great a, guy, but he's a freaking overachiever. Oh yeah, this, he. I don't know how he has time to be in college. I mean, <laughs> I went, went. All of us look lazy. I swear. <laughs> I went to engineering school um, out here at Stony Brook, and I mean, he's up at Cornell, and Cornell is a, a reputation for being a tough school. Mm -hmm. I don't know how he has time to be an engineering student and do all this stuff. I mean, he's working for. Um, MakerBot and, mm -hmm. and uh, doing his uh, Arduino t tutorial for Arduino. I have to get it right so we don't get sued. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I saw that little nutty fiasco. Yeah. 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 Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, he's definitely got a lot of stuff going, and it, it's good to see that. I mean, uh, he, uh, he has a lot of th things going. Robot Girl. Um, had us a ton of stuff going with her various uh, robots. Mm -hmm. um, she was walking around there with a uh, educational platform, right? Um, it was uh, it was hooked into I think an Android phone, and um, it was used. She had a numbers game basically, where the robot was the user interface. Um, I think she's uh, she's a Mac dev, so it was probably like an iPad or something. No, that that one was a, was Android. She was using the the ADK. The iPad was hooked up to another bird, uh, her big green bird, that uh, Robo bird. Ah, but she actually had both going. Gotcha. So um, she's multi talented, I guess. So then, from like all the stuff that you saw, what do you think is the most? Um, well, well, what what did you find most, interesting yeah. going on at the open hardware? Um. Some of the some of the interesting stuff I saw uh, would definitely be I mean, the electric uh, some of the electric vehicles. I mean, there was a guy on a, a skateboard tank, and that was just freaking awesome. <laughs> I saw uh, some of the pictures from that. And uh, some of the health stuff actually is pretty amazing too. Um, I actually went there the second day. They had uh, 
health stuff at Open Hardware Summit. I, I'm sorry, that was at Maker Faire. Yeah, we're well. not to Maker Faire yet. Oh, I'm we'll, sorry. We'll get there. <laughs> I'm still interested I'm about around. what all was going on at the Open Hardware Summit. Open Hardware, some of the most, um, you know, the really interesting stuff. Um, would be even just hearing the the saga of Instructables um, was pretty interesting. There was a a really good presentation about uh, some autonomous. Um, sailboats that are being used mm-hmm. to clean up oil spills mm-hmm. and uh that's something i'd like to see more of mm-hmm. and um just trying to think what else more you know, oil so. spills well no <laughs> more cleanup. i think we're going to get more oil spills whether we want them or not unfortunately <laughs> i got a um, really good solution for uh, oil spills don't stop <laughs> drilling <laughs> don't drill and don't transport oil in big tankers around the world do other stuff people other stuff I yeah. Um, Time for a change. And uh that's something I'd like to see happen as well. Um but there were and there were a few other uh presentations that were really good. Um I'm just trying to think I'm drawing a bit of a blank now. <laughs> that's all right. So let's I mean, see, we watched a... a couple of the uh the uh presentations there mm-hmm. and uh there was a one guy, I don't remember which group he was from. Maybe it was um Maybe it was MakerBot. He was really charismatic. Oh, that would be probably uh, Bree um, Pettis. Pettis. Yeah, and he Pettis was basically Pettis. saying if, you're, if, you're, if you have any interesting ideas and you're not sure if you're going to be able to do them in the very near future, put them out there, publish them. Right. That's his, um, I mean, his motto, uh, you could basically say, is share or die. And uh, it, it, you know, I think I, I believe that in, in a lot of ways. It's true. Um in the sense of, you know, it's not, this isn't the way he likes to put it, but the way I think of it is don't let things just die. If you're, if you're not using it, even if you're not going to work on it, share the ideas. Uh, get them out there because there are people that you will spark ideas in their heads mm-hmm. and get and them going. Them. Yeah, and um, there's a whole lot of that going on in our community. Like if somebody will have a little idea, they're not necessarily going to do it. They'll throw the idea up on their blog and somebody else will take it and run with it. Mm-hmm. It's great. There was another guy um, at the Open Hardware Summit. Uh, I forget the guy's name, but his company is Sentai. Oh, and... um, one second. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say about that is it's interesting to me in a social context of what's happening right now in uh, mm-hmm. software and hardware patents. His oh, idea yeah. can be taken a step further to say it's not just about sharing your ideas with the community. It is about that to a certain extent. And, you know, it's good... If you've got a good idea, share it with everybody else who's interested in doing that kind of stuff. You know, that helps everybody. But on the other side of that is that it's sort of a uh, an asymmetric patent war. Mm-hmm. Because you've got all these big guys, you know, buying up smaller companies to get their patents. Mm-hmm. As sort of like this patent arsenal. Like it's a like patent cold war is building up. And a lot of that goes back to the, the patent trolls. Um and uh, which that's the worst of it. Uh, the, the companies that all they do is just sue people. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I mean, it's not good on any end. And, and, you know, they're they're trying to fix the patents, but I think they're, they're just making them worse. Yeah, pretty much. They're, they're, nobody has a really good solution to this problem right now. So unfortunately, it's impossible to really talk solutions. Um, no. The only not person the- who I've really heard uh, talk about it in sensible way is... Uh, uh, he's an old professor. He works with the EFF a lot. Uh, what's his name? Anybody remember? No. I'm a person I'm thinking of is Don Lancaster. Uh, I don't know if that's um, who you're thinking of. No, no, no. I know who he is, but uh, oh, shoot, I wish I could remember because he's such a such a good guy. Does work with like Creative Commons and all sorts of places. Gotcha. But uh, uh, somebody suggested uh, while we were watching that that what was his name? Bree, you said. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Bree Some, I think it was John S. Uh, suggested that somebody should get around to creating a uh, nonprofit organization kind of based around what the EFF does, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. But for patents? Uh, yeah, for, for like hardware and software patents, where if you've got an idea and you don't necessarily want to own it, mm-hmm. you want it to be public domain, you can't really do that right now because of the cost of going out there and going to the trouble of 
um, creating proof of prior art. If somebody could come up with a foundation that you can submit your, your, your unpatent to, and then they have their team of volunteers of lawyers and whatnot that go about the business of like solidifying the legality of that idea being in the public domain, then nobody can ever steal it and lock it away. Um, I got to check into that because the way the laws have changed, I don't think it even matters now, prior art. I think it's just really? first to file. You're kidding um, me. They're, this is what's been changing in the last few weeks. Um, oh, my gosh. And uh, I, haven't re- I can't uh, speak on it too much because I haven't read it in depth, but I know that that was one of the changes, and it's not in the right direction. Doesn't yeah, it obviously. cost like, at, like quite a bit of, mo- of money to just file it? The patent search alone that you have to do ahead of time costs you thousands. Yeah, I mean, the whole filing process, wow. you could easily spend um, you know, three or $4,000 on. <laughs> Um, I know I actually have some friends who one of them works as a patent agent, not a patent lawyer. He's, he's mm-hmm. just an agent. And, um, you know, he, it, it costs a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the most important thing is anybody who thinks that they should get a patent, don't go to one of those, you know, people on TV, <laughs> the inventor's <laughs> helpline or whatever the hell they are. Because yeah. they're just, they'll all just they want to do is take your money. Sure. And, you know, when a lot of people talk about this sort of stuff, it's sort of like... Uh, in in the spirit of like armchair politics kind of talk but the reality on this show when we talk about it is i can think of at least two of our previous guests that own more than one patent each Mm -hmm. so when we talk about it here it's like this stuff affects the the folks who are involved you know we we, we're all inventors so patents kind of a big topic here Mm -hmm. it is and there are there's a lot of people out there, and not definitely not the guests on this show, but there you can definitely get uh, people call them ego patents. Um, you know, you can come up with a completely useless idea that no one's come up with before and get it patented. There's nothing to stop you from doing that. Yeah. Um, in the end, you end up with a nice shiny plaque to hang on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> uh... But uh, and something to put on your resume. But uh, I mean, I I don't have my name on uh, any patents myself, but I've been a part of a number of them. Um, at a few companies I've worked at, um, that's one of the other things is when you work at a company, whether or not they attribute, you know, you get, you Mm -hmm. get, uh, uh, attribution or if, you know, well, you're at the time I was just a junior engineer. So, wow, we're not putting you on there. Mm -hmm. That type of stuff. Mm -hmm. One nice thing about zombie tech is that the, the folks at the patent office have already been eaten. And Let them go for it. They get there's no for like <laughs> legal recourse available towards somebody who wants to go. Uh, I made that idea before. You're not allowed to use it, right? It's like if I want to build this thing my way, I'm just going to do it now, which would be yeah. awesome. <laughs> but then, of course, there's going to be zombies trying to eat you, so that's not so awesome. <laughs> well, we'll have our arsenal of super soakers filled with acid. So right, battery That'll acid. Work. Yep. All right. So uh, Maker Fair. I bet that mm-hmm. was like crazy. Oh yeah, lots of crazy stuff at Maker Fair. Um, this was uh, the same location, but out, outside um, and in, inside. Mm-hmm. But uh, there definitely were. Uh, um, you know, we had Arc Attack with the uh, Tesla coil music and um, all sorts of uh, robots. And there was, a, there was a guy with a spider chair walking around. <laughs> cool, like a hexapod <laughs> type of thing. No, this was this was more of a, a mechanical. Um, it was it, they weren't individually controlled. Everything uh. was chain driven, but uh, it could turn, and you know it had two sides, kind of like a tank uh, control almost. Mm-hmm. Um, there was someone with a with an off road vehicle for wheelchairs. Um, it was kind of like a six wheeled vehicle you drive your wheelchair up onto. <laughs> so that's good because it gives you know handicapped folks need a, a fighting chance against to get away from <laughs> zombies as well. Absolutely. Equal opportunity here, guys. <laughs> yeah, I know Adam hasn't uh, read Neil Stevenson yet. You need to get to that. But there's okay. a, uh, a, uh, a fictional character, obviously, but he's a veteran, and uh, during combat, he was extremely badly uh, burned, lost the ability to use his arms, his legs, his vision, everything. Mm-hmm. And this is a cyberpunk, you know, themed novel. So... Basically, what he's done, and he's taking a uh, 
a Hummer and built his own um, life support system onto the inside of the Hummer and basically turned the outside into his mobile wheel wheelchair with, you know, gun turrets on the top and loudspeakers and lights. Awesome. Oh, wow. Seriously awesome. Very cool. It's only a few steps away from a Dalek, though, so you got to be careful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You definitely True. don't want a, a whole bunch of those kind of cyborgs rolling around. Exterminate. Exterminate. <laughs> Gosh, I can't wait for the next episodes of Doctor Who to hit Netflix. Which, yeah, and uh, that was one of the cool things at Maker Fair was uh, the architect guys playing Doctor Who, the theme song on Tesla coils. Oh, nice. that's great. Nice. Freaking awesome. Nice. Uh, with kids in a cage, they had... Uh, two youngsters in a, in a cage um, that probably had no idea what the song was. <laughs> now they enjoyed it. Not too long ago, you I think it was you that uh, was showing me a piece of uh, electronic music history. Uh, they pulled a machine out of a barn somewhere in France. France or England? It was in Europe. I, uh, I know the the lady that built it was English, but I think they they pulled it out of a barn in France. I think that was what right. it was. And this lady was a member of a group of musicians. She had splintered off before she built the machine, but uh, the group that she splintered off from, I believe, was the same group that created the intro music for the uh, original Doctor Who music. And that was one of the earliest examples of like electronic synthesized music. Right. Way, way back. Yeah, and I mean... The I, the orig, the oldest one of the older forms of electronic music is probably the theremin, um, but this was the first time they were creating waveforms and and uh, you know really uh, they had some control over it, and uh, it's it's kind of amazing how this stuff always gets lost though like the uh, the the THX um, machine that did the deep note here at the beginning of all the movies yeah that was lost um, you know all sorts of uh, interesting uh, hardware that's just kind of disappeared and hopefully will come back someday like this one did. Mark Van De Wettering and I have done a few little experiments uh, on that THX style effect. Mm -hmm. He uh, took a whole bunch of sine waves and detuned them all differently. Mm -hmm. Played them all simultaneously and then allowed their detunings to all drift closer to true. Which is basically what the, the deep note does. Yeah. And then he said that uh, they used cello, a sample of a cello or something to do it. Um, and he was asking if I could do a, a sample of a lot of harmonics on one of our Hammond organs here in the recording studio. And I oh, did that. Oh, that's what that was for. Yeah, that's what that was for. Mark was going <laughs> to play with it. I don't, I don't know like... if he ever got it. Well, I don't but know. Uh, yeah, Eddie was down there sitting at the organ pushing down a couple of big chords for me. For like and I recorded forever. it up here. Oh, wow. <laughs> like with all the stops pulled out, I imagine. Uh, not all of them, but very specifically um, the equal, uh, like uh, the, the fundamental twice, you know, the harmonic and then twice mm -hmm. that rather than, you know, some of the thirds and fifths and whatnot. Gotcha. Very cool. Um, that's, that's some of the stuff that I'm into. I don't, I don't go that far back, but uh, a lot of the 70s uh, synthesizers are, I have a lot of fun with. Um, you know, I don't own a, a mini Moog, but one of these days I'll get my hands on one. Cool. We'll keep our eyes peeled for you. The uh, history of like electronic music is a very funny thing because it depends on your definition of so many things to just say, okay, this was early or mm -hmm. not. Because... You think of those synthesizers for Doctor Who, and that's like the earliest electronic music, but not really because the Hammond organs that were electromechanical run all the way back to the 30s. Right. And you don't really and, think of those as being electronic instruments, but they are. And that kind of ties into the whole Renaissance engineer thing, because a lot of these, uh, a lot of the musicians were kind of renaissance engineers because they were mixing mechanical, electrical, and, you know, as the years moved by, electronic then, and uh, now even software, um, is, is all pushed into the mix to the, to the end of making, um, hopefully, music, but if not, then interesting sounds. Mm -hmm. um, I usually get the interesting sounds more than the music when I do the stuff. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> That's all right. 
That's right. Um, Got to come up yeah, with like those two. One of my, you know, uh, somebody I really like is uh, Brian May um, from Queen, who, you know, his dad was an electrical engineer, and the, the two of them together built a guitar, and um, they were doing things with uh, having the pickups in phase and out of phase. Um, he has actually switches on it, and um, they, you know, heating the uh, truss bar over the, the kitchen stove, things like that. Um, mm-hmm. And it's really that you know they they got into the nuts and bolts of building an instrument, which I know you guys do, and I've done some of as well. Um, and a lot of people don't know about that stuff anymore. It's the same thing, you know, with the with the web. I mean, when I learned what a computer was, uh, I was programming it. We, you know, everybody was programming it in school. Nowadays, it's, you know, here's a here's the Google page. Go have fun. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, nowadays I, you've got the the young maker community is somewhat centered around stuff like Lego and Arduino kind of things. And it, it relates to what I was saying earlier about that. There's layers between you and what you're really doing. Right. And the more uh, you get into this, uh, desire to be, that renaissance engineer, the more you want to strip those layers away. Exactly. And, and somebody who's doing that um, and is going to be doing a kit with that stuff is um, Wendell from Evil Med Scientist Labs. Mm. Um, he was showing off a Digicomp, which was, and now we're moving again back to the 60s, it was a, a toy um, computer, and you could basically do some ALU commands. It, it looks almost like a toy um, uh, pinball machine, you drop marbles down, but uh, it actually has little flip flops and accumulators in it, and you program it like a computer and it drops marbles for each um, clock cycle huh. and he 's bringing this back out. I guess he got the rights to it, and he has the equipment to make a kit um, so it uh, this is hopefully you know his hope is that it can teach kids a little bit about what 's going on inside these. Uh, You know, you can open up the computer and then you see the chips or the black box. Mm -hmm. Um, What's going on inside there? So let me ask actually um, just a couple of things. We we went back to talking about Renaissance Engineer. And um, do you have any plans for your site, you know, in terms of like, do you have any new projects that you want to work on besides the quadcopter? Uh, Or is Um, that mainly it? I mean, you know. Oh, no, no. I have lots of stuff I'm working on. I've... I've, uh, has a rep wrap in process. Um, okay. I, uh, I'd like to get a, a whole fab lab actually set up, um, you know, with, a uh, uh, some sort of, uh, I do have a, a small lathe and milling machine for metal, but I'd like to get some CNC, uh, stuff built. Um, okay. also some electronics projects, um, kind of working on, uh, some stuff with the, uh, the Korg monotron as a, uh, mm. kind of explaining that I'll try to do some videos. Okay. Um, Hopefully, Korg won't get too pissed at me for doing that. But <laughs> well, maybe, you know. where'd you get that Korg? Um, I got it from uh, the site uh, Toy Makers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was like, uh, Toy Makers. That sounds very familiar. Yeah, little, little shameless <laughs> plug there. You can you can get stuff that we talk about on these shows at our, our store. And before too long, it'll here just be tymkrs dot com, and there'll be a little link there, and you can find all this crazy stuff that we talk about. But uh, I'm yeah, interested and, to see what Adam does with that, actually. And yeah, I'd like to. I mean, I don't think anybody's really gone through uh, an instrument like that because you can do quite a bit with it, and um, it's a simple circuit, a, a series of simple circuits. Um, and Korg was nice enough to publish the schematic for it, which was great. Mm-hmm. But when you know somebody looks at that schematic, there's a hell of a lot going on, and it, it can be daunting. So I, I, I thought it might be a good idea to kind of break that down and. Uh, cool explain it and uh, actually get people to the point where they could build their own. Right. Um, right. So I love schematic analysis. It's, it's a fun process. Oh yeah. This is why I like Addie because she says stuff like, I love schematic analysis, (laughs) (laughs) but it is, it's, it's, you know, you learn so much more about the different components and what they do and what, you know, you realize how much you don't know about what, how the components work and then you get to look it up. So, mm-hmm. yeah. and uh, it gets really crazy with some of the the more the really advanced analog stuff. I mean, I'm more of a digital guy in general, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, there's times I got to say, "What the hell is going on?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, there's a lot of that too. <laughs> so. So then, but, um, so oh, any other projects before I? Other other stuff I'm doing. Um, I mean, my my ultimate goal is you know, assuming society doesn't fall, is uh, to kind of get the consulting business going and, or okay. um, do something on my own. Sure. Um, you, you know, I have a lot of a lot of ideas. Probably do that even if society fell. You'd be like a tech consultant uh, for. I'd be happy zombies. to survive. <laughs> You'd be like, okay, I see you have a problem here. You want to eat my brains, and here's that's just my not going to work out. There's only one, one to go around. Baseball here. bat to the head, <laughs> Long Island style. It would have to be an aluminum bat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Addie, we got about ten minutes left, so uh, Do why we? don't you jump into your uh, your 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 grillum section here? Okay. Well, first, I, I thought it was really cool that you do robotics and you teach kids and stuff like that. Is it pretty easy to get involved in one of those um, mentorship sorts of positions? Um, the first robotics um, competition, which is the, the current, the big, the big guy currently, um, there's a lot of high schools involved and a lot of them need uh help mentoring and, um, you know, they always need money, but they need mentoring help as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I don't have the website in front of me. I I believe it's first.org, but... Mm -hmm. uh, we can check it, yeah. Yeah, that's um, that's one of the ways to get involved. Um, what I did also is I, I worked through with one of the high schools, um, not, not, not high school, I'm sorry, middle schools. Mm -hmm. um, it was a gifted program, um, and... Uh, it is not that address. It's not that address. Okay. Um, Let's we'll see if we can find it. Yeah, we can find it. It'll be good. But they, I was lucky enough that they came looking. I happened to be working at a hobby shop at the time. It's uh, uh, usfirst.org. Yes. Okay. So you were working at a hobby shop, and they said they they were looking for someone to <laughs> teach a uh, a class, and uh, I said, well, I, I can teach robotics, and. Um, it was a lot of fun actually setting that up mm -hmm. and um you know every time you see the kids get that look on their face where they understand an idea mm -hmm. um you know like i taught them binary you know i walked into the room and said okay how high can you count on your fingers <laughs> that's and awesome go, 10 and uh i said well i, I can count to 1023 on my fingers <laughs> of course nobody believed me and right um and then you know, from there was kind of a, a leapfrog into teaching binary. That's cool. That's a nice way to do it. I'll have so. to figure out how to count to a thousand twenty three on my fingers. <laughs> well, Addie, there are ten different kinds of people in the world: those that understand binary and those that don't. Ha ha ha. <laughs> okay. All right. So then. Um, but if I you talk to your local schools. Um, and some of the adult ed courses, you know, adult ed groups or BOCES. Like, well, we have a, we have BOCES, but any of the uh, um, those groups, they're always looking for educators, and and uh, there's a whole lot of ways to get into it. Cool, gotcha. Thanks. Um, all right, so these are the few questions now that I usually ask everybody. Okay. Three tools that you would bring uh, in you know, that you would keep on yourself during a zombie apocalypse or that you would bring to your zombie apocalypse bunker? Um, let's see. I definitely want that aluminum bat. Yep, <laughs> aluminum bat. Um, I'd want, uh, I'd want my Leatherman tool. Okay. Um, and, uh, because that thing just, you know, you can pretty much do anything with it. Mm-hmm. And does it have to be a hand tool? Can it be a... Uh... It can be a power tool. A power tool. Yeah. Hmm. I think we have Roy strapping some of the solar panels on his back, so... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Roy's, um, Roy's going to be one of the power generator team guys. Yep. <laughs> He's got experience with his home system. I would, I, I mean, I, it, it's hard, it's hard because I'm thinking of taking, you know, I want my whole toolbox there. I want my soldering iron and, uh, you know, um, generator and being, you know, to be able to, to oh, have enough tools generator. to build other tools. Sure. Um, sure. But, uh, I think if I had to pick a third tool, assuming I had power for it, it would probably be, um, 
uh, actually no, even, even if I didn't have power, I'd, I'd take some sort of a saw, a, a big, you know, a large hand saw because you know you're gonna need shelter. You're gonna need to, yep. to and you can swing that around and hit the zombies True. as well if you need to. Yeah. Leatherman's or uh, Gerber, or, you know, whatever brand of it you like, have been popular, and uh, saws have been popular. Like Seems uh, those two uh, are. sawzall, for example. Yeah, well, that's that's what I was thinking of was a sawzall, and uh, <laughs> I mean, because you got to cut branches, you got to build yourself a shelter of some sort. Yep. Um, Assuming you're in a place that doesn't have a building, um, and well, even we're, if you... we're taking over Home Depot, and that actually uh, that was something I was thinking about because right here <laughs> on Long Island there happens to be a uh, a mall that's Home Depot mm -hmm. next to Staples mm -hmm. next to Models, which is a sporting goods store. Nice. Um, in all in one building that's also attached to a radio station. Nice. So you have your... <laughs> I like it. <laughs> we could definitely hack a radio like station. It. That would be um, good. I dig it. <laughs> there's a Five Guys burger and fry in there. And oh all of this gosh. is directly next to Power uh, plant? an airport. Airport. So I don't know, man. Uh, that's that's kind of a You just need a power pretty... plant now. <laughs> well, the, air, the airport has some power on site uh, because it used to be a, uh, it was the Republic, it's actually Republic Airport. It was the Republic plant uh, where they built all the uh, planes back in World War II. Oh, man. So they must uh, have some sort of manufacturing thing still there. A lot, well, that, a lot of it is where the Home Depot is now. It, you know, it all got torn uh, down. Dang but, it. But uh, there's a few buildings <laughs> left and who knows what's in them. That's right. Right. So that's, that's where that's actually a pretty a pretty tempting location, but there's a lot of people in Long Island. Yeah, a I, lot more I would than not here. stay on that island. I don't know if. Uh... Oh yeah, this would if I had a hole up somewhere, I'd be heading there, you know, for the first night, and then as soon as I could get off the island, I'd be jumping in a plane and you know teach myself to fly real quick <laughs> and survive. Real, 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 real quick. quick. <laughs> All right. It's, and uh, that, I'd, uh, uh what is it the get Hudson? off the island Hudson River on that side or is it uh, something else and we have the the Long Island Sound to the north and uh, the ocean the Atlantic Ocean to the south mm. so uh, yeah that, that sounds like it's cold water no no yeah, real real quick learn to fly yeah because... <laughs> I'm not going to learn to swim. So, no. I mean, well, I can not swim, like but I'm not going to swim. I can't swim to Connecticut. Not like that. So, okay. we actually we do have uh, ferries that go to Connecticut if we need to. Um, you know, car ferries to avoid New York City, um, which that would be my next option. If I couldn't get a plane, I'd be trying to get one of those ferries um, or, or any boat over to Connecticut because you can see it from the, the North Shore of Long Island. You know, get off the island into a less populated area. Yeah. Yeah. Although, depending on where you go, you end up in Bridgeport, which is a pretty big city to begin with. So gotcha. you'd have to kind of go up the, the coast, maybe to Maine or something. <laughs> Folks on the coast <laughs> tend to think of us here in the Midwest as the flyover states until there's a zombie apocalypse. Then they look at us as prime real estate. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you want to be as far away from big cities as you can get. Mm -hmm. True. And we do have... have one of the world's largest hospital system here, so that's good. And you're not too far from Canada, so there's <laughs> so nobody up there. Fails, zombies aren't gonna want aren't gonna want to go up to Canada. So no, they're all heading to Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let me see. I'm trying to think. We have one good question. John S came up with this, I believe, and he said, "If you were in a library." Uh, and you only had time to pick out three books for the zombie apocalypse. What three books would you find the most useful? I think we have, what, a minute, one minute, two Ten. minutes? Yeah, a couple we, minutes. We got a couple minutes, so I will settle for one book. What one book would you find to be the most useful oh, in the geez. zombie apocalypse? In the zombie apocalypse? Yep. Um, the worst case scenario. Assuming a library would have it, but uh, that that's a an entire book of of what to do in the absolute worst case. You're kidding me. No, I, I have it. It's a it real book. Shelf. Yes. That is brilliant. I accept. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Worst case scenario. I'm gonna There's have to pick it up. A... Is it good? Oh yeah, it's really good. Um, some of the some of them are a little over the top. Some of the situations, but there's a board game that goes along with it too. Um, <laughs> but the book itself um, is probably on Amazon. Um, it's, and it's a, it's a lot of fun to read. 
Cool. Sounds good. I accept. We'll check it out. If it looks interesting, we'll throw it in the old uh, toy maker store. Indeed. Yeah. All right. So. I think that uh, pretty much wraps up this hour. Mm-hmm. All right. It's been fun. Yeah. Thanks for coming in and hanging out with us and sharing information with all the uh, folks out there, Adam. Indeed. Oh, definitely. Anytime. And keep so. us, and you'll have to keep us up to date on the uh, aircraft. Uh, I'll drop technology flyers. and you'll drop flyers. <laughs> As I'm flying over your house. <laughs> the toy maker's compound. Sweet. <laughs> all right. Sounds good. All right. Thanks. Yep. And so I, we'll I, uh, see you all next week on uh, Thursday, as yep. usual. Yep. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, you can automatically download this show by uh, using the iTunes uh, link on the side of the page. And uh, you can also sign up through the RSS feed on your phone or your uh, music player. And it will just automatically go grab it for you. And you can listen to it on your drive to work or while you're exercising, whenever. Correct. And if you want to check out um, Adam's information and follow him, he's AJ Fabio uh, on Twitter. He is Vaya Con Queso on our um, Savage Circuits IRC chat. And he is the Rengineer, T H E R E N, Genier <laughs> dot com. Um, and that's where his blog is going to be, or is, I should say. Is, yeah. Yep. So until next week, we'll see you guys later. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye.